Great. Well, welcome everyone. We're back for book club meeting number eight, uh, chapter seven, The Trap of Routine Assessment. And we're very lucky once again to have Audrey Waters here. And we're very lucky to have Courtney Bell, uh, formerly of the Education Testing Service, but much more recently, as in this summer, um, <laughs> to the University of Wisconsin. And then as always, we're super grateful to have folks here um, with all different kinds of backgrounds from all different parts of education. For those of you who are here live, uh, welcome. If you could introduce yourself in the chat and tell us who you are and where you're from and what kinds of things you work on and how the weather is where you are, uh, we'd uh, love to get to know who's here. And for those of you who have made it back uh, week after week, it's just a real treat to see you again and have you join us. Um, so, Courtney, the way that we ask everyone to introduce themselves, we'll, we'll get more into your background specifically, but maybe you can start with your ed tech story. Is there any particular uh, moment as a student or as a teacher that got you interested in assessment or interested in education technology or what, 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 what stands out to you as you think about your pathway here? Yeah, so two things. One, which maybe then, Justin, you're going to say to yourself, oh, wow, I really should have rethought this guest. But so the first one is in graduate school, we had to take a course at a different institution. And as a graduate student, um, you know, you have that kind of self-consciousness of, oh, maybe I don't really understand what like the big point here is. So here we were listening to this super famous science educator who this gives away my age um, was working with palm pilots and this this science teacher educator researcher person was like going on and on about how this palm pilot was this amazing data collection tool it was going to revolutionize k-12 science education and i am sitting there like wheels turning as fast as they can turn like okay i don't get it the kids are and i had just been a science teacher i just been a high school science teacher biology I don't get it. How is this going to revolutionize this? What am I missing? So I come to ed tech as a skeptic, I should say first. <laughs> so a born right. skeptic about well, say, ed tech. Say more, say more. I don't know if you can remember in that moment, um, you know, what was it about the description of the Pym pilot that just seemed totally discordant with reality for you? Well, the first and most important thing is it's, it solved a problem I'd never had as a teacher. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't have any trouble getting people to write things down and collect data. Like, I had 8 million probes <laughs> that I could use. I had like awesome graphing calculators. Why do I need a palm pilot? Like, I just, it solved a problem I didn't have as a teacher. So I'm like, okay, I must be missing something. Maybe somebody else has this problem. I don't know. That's great. Um, did you say there was a second one? Yeah. So the second one, so that's like the skeptic in me, which goes to the second story, which sends the skeptic in this way. And I can share a slide to show people this setup later if we're curious about it. But so when I was at ETS, we partnered with two organizations, Teaching Works, and uh, which is a kind of center at the University of Michigan run by Deborah Ball, for those of you who know stuff about math ed, and Francesca Forzani, her colleague there. And so they were busy working on these things called high leverage practices, which are like discrete teaching practices that um, all teachers do across grade levels. They look very different across grade levels and subjects, but they're important and they um, are repetitive. People do them a lot. So teachers do them a lot. And so we've been partnering with them and Mersion, which is an ed tech company that we can say more about in a second, but they do this kind of AI supported avatar technology. So it's basically a person, an actor actually, when the company was originally founded, an actor behind an animating a number of avatars on the screen and so like a digital puppetry kind of thing. you got it digital sort of puppetry. somebody sitting in a warehouse with an xbox controller and a voice modulator making five little avatars that look like children talk to people and stuff like that and it's a one actor to a five kid thing in the case like justin is describing so what you hit you what you do in real time is they bring they brought the technology the ets to show us this and so you would put on this headset and this it had a microphone around it and a camera would capture you. And what you were looking at, imagine yourself standing in front of a big like slide projector screen like you would for a PowerPoint slide projector. So, so you're up there in front of it and it's projecting, you know, it's capturing you and you've got this headset on. And then the kids would say something. They would say like, oh, hi, Miss Bell. 
And I, so I watched a couple of people go through what we call the simulator. And I was like, huh. And everyone's quiet. And they kept asking, like, oh, you want to hop in? You want to hop in? You want to? Okay. So I'm like, I'm in. So what was really weird for me is this. I fully, the skeptic in me, fully expected this to be like a kind of performing, like, oh, how, you know, me thinking about how do I get these, how do I test this assessment system? That's what I thought it was going to feel like. And that is not at all what it felt like. It felt like some kind of, somebody needed to have an, an MRI on my brain. Like I seriously felt like I was a high school teacher again. These like neural pathways that I was enacting of the like calling on the kids who are, by the way, little cartoons, puppets. And I know that full well, right? And completely interacting with them using the kinds of thinking that, that I did as a teacher, both as a high school teacher and as a university teacher. And that was a profound experience to me. Until I was inside that simulator, I would never have believed it would have felt that way. That's great. So, so, the, so the skeptic, um, you know, fully, fully prepared to screen new technologies and say, ah, uh -uh, that's not what's going to work. That's not what's going to be helpful. And then you found something that you could step into this kind of digital teaching simulator where you go, wow, this is making me exercise my brain in a way that feels really real and authentic to me and could potentially be, be helpful to other teachers. That's great. That's a great introduction. Um, so we probably ought to ask you for like a little bit more background just so people know where you're coming from. So you're a biology teacher um, and then you taught for a little bit at the University of Connecticut and then you went in and worked at educational testing services. Um, yep. Which and so, for the folks who are out of the country, maybe, maybe, maybe you could just describe what ETS is and what your work there was like. Yeah, ETS is a nonprofit testing company. Um, so all that nonprofit part means is that the, the money that they do make from those test fees that all of us pay for various tests, the GRE, TOEFL, TOEIC, for those of you who are out of the country, you're probably more familiar with those. Those then get invested back into the public good. And one of the versions of the public good is supporting foundational basic science research on all kinds of things within the assessment domain. So while I was there, I started and led a center um, that developed assessments of teaching quality. And some of them were technology enhanced kinds of assessments and some of them were not at all, like observation tools out in schools in US and around the globe actually. And I most recently, um, when, just before I left at the end of June this past year, we're just in the process, it'll be released next week by the OECD. We were doing a big large scale study in eight countries of how the relationship between teaching and learning uh, using all different kinds of assessment tools. So my assessment background focuses on observation tools, but we've used multiple choice items, all kinds of computer adaptive stuff, all kinds of stuff like around portfolios. So lots of different kinds of ways, but all for me personally around the assessment of teaching and teachers. Uh, that said, people that were in my center focused on students and their learning as well. Great. So your expertise is in this sort of really challenging domain of teaching is this immensely complex task where the outcomes of what happens from teaching is really hard to trace. Um, you know, as, as all teachers know, sometimes it's obvious that the kid in front of you clicks and gets it. And then sometimes it looks like it's obvious, but they actually <laughs> knew it before and you haven't taught them a thing. And then sometimes it looks like they totally don't get it at all. And a month later, they snap, you know, something from November with something from December and have this major breakthrough. Um, and, you know, and half of what you're doing isn't really related to academic content anyway. It's making sure they feel like good, healthy, whole people. Um, and how do we figure out who's doing that well and what they're doing when they do that well so we can tell other people about what that works look like and, you know, raise a, another generation of educators to, you know, be a little bit better than the last one. Is that a reasonable way of capturing sort of what you're, what you're aiming for? For sure. Complex performance assessment is what I would call it for shorthand in assessment language. Good. Yeah. So, so on uh, where if simple performance assessment would be, you know, can you, can you add, can you repeat something? Can you right. remember a list of numbers or something like that? And this is complex doing, doing a real world task. Okay. So hopefully now it's obvious to people why we invited you here to talk with us about the trap of routine assessment. One of these things that I describe as sort of a fundamental dilemma for education technology that we, that we, if we can't get better at, uh, at assessment technologies, um, then there's going to be parts of our education technology that, that remain stunted for a long time. Um, maybe we'll pull in Audrey Waters into the conversation here, and, and Audrey, and then Courtney, maybe you can just sort of, especially for folks who 
had a chance to read the chapter. Kind of what did you take away from it? What are sort of the, the key arguments and key ideas here? And then we can get into, you know, what you think worked and made sense and, and what was a problem. Um, I, uh, Audrey, do you want to start us off? Yeah, I'll, I want to say a couple, one thing about ETS. I actually just finished. Um, yeah, anything. I just finished working on a book on some of the history of ed tech and one of the people who um, one of the people who I look at is Ben Wood. Um, he was he ran ETS for a while, but his archives were at ETS headquarters in New Jersey. And he was a professor at Columbia in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. Um, and he was one of the very first people he managed to. So he was really interested in standardized testing. Um, early, um, you know, and early standardized testing. And at the time, things were graded by, by hand. And he was one of the first who became really interested in the idea of starting to use computational machinery, business machinery at the time, in order to be able to scale assessment, right? And so it's just interesting to think about, you know, we have this really long legacy of what assessment started to look like um, almost a hundred years ago in order for it to scale. Um, he happened to have a partnership uh, reached out to IBM and was very interested in building machines that would automate the grading of tests. And we th which think about what those kinds of machines would look like in the 1930s. Um, it's not a surprise that they were multiple choice tests, right? And so just thinking about the machinery that, the machinery that we use to um, automate assessment has, is actually sort of one of those classic, almost like cart before the horse <laughs> kinds of things. And that in some ways we're still, we're still using um, a technology of assessment, the multiple choice test, um, that's, that's, you know, a hundred years old. Um, and so I think what's, what's interesting is thinking about the new, the talking about, I liked how you talked about Tutor, the programming language from Plato, is that we think that we're building these brand new, artificial intelligence assessments that are using the latest and greatest in data analysis and machine learning. But really there's this whole other really long legacy of assessment um, that we still, <laughs> we're still, that we're still kind of stuck with. And, and Plato was a computer system that was developed at the University of Illinois uh, Urbana-Champaign. Um, it was, uh, you know, one of the first massively networked computer systems. And so people bought terminals rather than machines and they hooked into the, you know, like we do now with most computers, but it was sort of, um, you know, a kind of internet before there was an internet. Um, and, uh, and Tutor was one of the very first programming languages for Play-Doh after machine code. And it was called Tutor because one of the main things that people tried to do with the Play-Doh computer system was to teach other people. Um, you know, one of the, they taught them lots of things. You know, the, the example that I cite in the book is from a lesson about art history. Um, but a lot of what they taught was math. And then of course, you know, universally throughout the history of computer assisted instruction, people are trying to teach computer programming. Um, some of the most popular lessons in Tutor were how to use Tutor to program um, other lessons that people could take in in other topics. So there's sort of, a, you know, one, one theme in the book is that our, you know, not only our education technologies, but in some ways our whole learning systems are shaped by what assessment technologies are available to us. And those assessment technologies have always been limited. They've always been constrained in in various ways. And then of course, everyone should buy Teaching Machines that comes out next year um, from MIT Press by Audrey Waters, which I've had a chance to read and is outstanding. And I, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do another conversation like this. But Courtney, wh what, would be, what would be your takeaway on the trap of routine assessment? I love the ideas that that um, sort of connects back to the workplace. I love like the connection back to the sociological, which is right. Society keeps valuing these things that um, in very simple terms just are more and more increasingly complex human behaviors, whether it's problem solving or collaboration. Um, and so increasingly, both economically and as humans, we value those things that's fine and we're able to take apart and decompose or dissect the lower level things, but it's that that we teach to computers. And so 
computers by definition are always going to be our, our assessment technology to connect just into your words. Our, sex, our assessment technology is always going to be back behind the thing that we value in society and the thing we want most for our children or want most for our undergraduates, for example. And so that's a trap, right? And so how do we think about the nature of that trap? And one of the things the chapter offers for us is this idea that um, it might be possible to broaden out what those computers can do. If we could pick up a little bit here, like maybe the framing of a problem. It can't, we can't, the computer can't figure out how to, to score whether or not Courtney can problem solve, but the computer could figure out or help figure out, make more possible at scale, does Courtney have the ability to read a complex situation and frame the problem? That's one piece of problem solving, it's not the whole of it. So that to me is a very striking idea for a way to walk forward from a progress perspective. And, and you know, I think the chapter is a bit hand wavy about why this is so hard. You know, um, one, one of the arguments that I make is just sort of empirically, if you look back over the last 20 years, education policy makers, there, you know, there's, there's no serious person out there um, who is arguing, no, 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 we basically have all the education technology, the assessment technologies that we need. Um, let, you know, let, let's just use them. There's this sort of, you know, and, and with the, in the era in the United States of the Common Core, there are these two huge testing consortiums that are made. They have millions of dollars put behind them, Park and Smarter Balance, they're consortiums of state, with the to try to come up with better assessment. You know, and then there, there are universities, there's organizations like ETS and the College Board, like there's lots of smart people who are working on these things. Um, and somebody this morning actually in, in Russia asked me, um, well, when AI comes along, you know, how much of a difference is this going to make? Um, and I, you know, and my answer is something like, I don't think that much. Um, like we have, we've had super smart people working on this problem with millions of dollars at their disposal for a long, long time and lots of motivation, both financially, but also kind of like educationally and morally. I mean, I mean, I assume that the, that people in testing companies look at their tests and go, yeah, we wish these things were better. Um, and so why, but I, but I don't think I explained very well why it's the case that it's so hard to make progress. And I'm wondering if you who've been inside the belly of the beast um, can give us some more insight into, into that dilemma. Yeah, so I'm gonna try, Justin, if you'll let me, I don't know if you need to make me a hostess or, um, but I'd love to try think, to I share. I think I have. I'd like to try to share a slide. Let's see if we can pull that off. Um, let's see if this works. So, I. I think a first kind of, can you see this slide that has, it says overlap in activities. Yep. Okay, so don't read the slide for a second. It's a bad teaching move for a second. I should wait and tell you first, sorry. Um, so so first, can, we need to think together about what we mean by the word assessment, right? We wanna know some information from a certain kind of setting. And so we can think about these uh, contexts in which human beings interact in the world, let's say as practices with a little p practice. Um, not the practice, capital P of teaching, but a little p practice. Um, I engage in a certain way with students around, let's say, double digit subtraction, and it goes a certain way. That's a practice, and I do it repetitively. Okay, fine. So let's say what we really care about, we'll take it a student, let's, let's keep the teaching example. So let's say what I really care about um, from an assessment perspective is I really want to know, can Justin teach very well? That's really what I want to know. I want to assess that. And so Justin has a practice, a little key practice is called Justin's teaching. And it's going on all the time in the real world. So on the left hand side of the picture, this is a Venn diagram. There's Justin's real world practice of teaching. So for example, Justin you know, plans his lesson this week, he thinks about the unit. Teachers in general do not think only lesson by lesson. They often have a curriculum. Um, and then they make a plan for the lesson that that day, they go ahead, they teach the lesson, they think about the lesson, they reflect on it, and then they seek to address those lesson, maybe that particular lesson's strengths and weaknesses over time. Maybe they, you know, found out that Audrey didn't understand in the lesson on Monday, and so the teacher decides, oh, gotta reteach that thing on Tuesday. Okay, fine. That all happens and that's a part of Justin's little key real world teaching practice. 
now we say to ourselves, we want to assess Justin's teaching. We want to know how well does Justin teach. We now have to intervene in some way in that real world phenomenon. In the case of children, this is in the real world phenomenon of how, like, for example, they learn how to read, right? They're learning how to read it. Lots of places, not just inside a school, they're learning in their homes as they drive down the street on their bicycles, et cetera, seeing stop signs. So when we layer on top of real world practice, which is the thing, again, we care about in assessment, the practice of assessment, now we create all kinds of things going on. First, we've got to make decisions about what lesson that we're going to go watch of Justin's. Justin's going to engage in selecting that lesson. If I'm Justin's principal, he's going to think real carefully about which lesson he invites me to if he gets the choice to invite me. Justin and I as principal and teacher might go back and forth about that lesson, et cetera, and on and on. The point here being that the assessment practice of observing Justin teach or Justin's teaching in an assessment situation is not the same by definition from Justin's real world teaching. This that is, is the, like the observer mm -hmm. effect that people see throughout science. You know, yeah. this, that when you that when you do things, when you intervene in some way, um, the the circumstances become different. Like what we would ideally want to evaluate is this sort of abstract thing called real teaching. But as soon as we start looking at Justin's real teaching, we don't get Justin's real teaching anymore. We get sort of Justin's teaching under assessment. That is exactly right. And you cannot escape that. That fact is like, maybe somebody will argue with us, Justin. I hope they okay. do. <laughs> My assertion is that's always true in every assessment. And so if that's the case, then we think to ourselves, where can technology fit into this thing? And so some people argue that the thing we need to do is to create, to use technology to create um, opportunities to make the, the assessment space more like the real world space, right? This is the gaming stuff that you talk about. Um, an example of this that, that we see um, that's a low tech version of it is when we started to do student portfolios, like Vermont actually had a huge effort around student portfolios. So we want to like keep the things and then use technologies, various kinds of technologies to build upon the, the real world setting. So for us, I think whenever we're assessing and the places where we can imagine assessment technology coming in, unless it's, it figures out which pieces of this are we gonna engage the technology in? We will always be doing the kinds of machine learning kinds of things that you're reacting to your Russian colleagues with, like, yeah, pretty sure you're not gonna make a lot of progress on that. So we have to be clear eyed about the reality that there is only so much right this second about the real world that the technology can get at. And so people will be dissatisfied until we begin to learn about, for example, things as complex as games and simulations and et cetera. But that's not gonna get us out of the problem that those are not the thing that we really want. What we really want is do kids understand science? Can kids problem solve, et cetera? So I would say a thing that you're maybe arguing against in the book is that I, I think one way you can interpret my chapter is I say, look, what we basically do with assessments is some form of pattern matching. And the pattern matching was very simple and very boring with the Plato system. You just programmed a list of answers into it. And if they matched the list of answers originally, actually some of the programming had to be very precise. Like if, you know, if someone misspelled the number five as FIV and it wasn't in your bank, like they got the answer wrong. Um, and much of what we've done to improve assessment since then is to make sort of more complex pattern matching. You know, like basically when we, you know, when, when Duolingo or when other language learning apps are deciding whether or not you've pronounced a word correctly, they're still not really listening to the word. They're just like looking at a bank of probabilities about what correctly pronounced words look like and seeing if your pronunciation kind of lines up with that. And I sort of make the claim like, well, it seems like the way we're going to make assessment better is by coming up with like more and more clever ways of doing that kind of pattern matching. And I hear you saying, no, that's maybe not, that might be one thing to do. But a more interesting thing to do is to ask the question, can technologies create environments in which people, in which we sort of have more observational control, but people still perform in ways that seem authentic and natural to them, like you described with this Mersion teaching, 
um, where you know a great thing about the immersion teaching is that you can basically do it in front of any computer monitor. It doesn't have to be with a particular group of students on a particular day in a particular whatever. Um, that 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 is a more promising way of getting out of the trap of routine assessment is like building cooler worlds for people to perform in rather than just trying to do better pattern matching about their responses. How, how fair how fair is that? And I would add not, I think that's fair. And I would add not just cooler, there's actually something very specific we're aiming at. We're aiming at the activity, we want the technology to be able to get us closer to the real world actions that the person is engaged in that we care about. So in the case of teachers, we care, their quality of in teaching inheres in part in their decision-making, their moment-to-moment -moment decision making. Do they hear Audrey tell them, tell the teacher the wrong answer and decide to ignore Audrey because the teacher's then gonna call on Justin, who she knows has tracked that math problem, is gonna be able to explain to the class the steps that he went through, or does the teacher make the choice let me let Audrey say whatever Audrey's gonna say and I'm gonna work with what Audrey brings to us as a class. That's a decision a teacher makes in a moment. So if we can get our technology to get our teachers, for example, in this case, our students in the space where they're more likely to engage in the behavior we care about, we're much more likely to learn something that's worth knowing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let uh, Candice Till, um, who's coming in next week for uh, the toxic power of data and assessment. Um, Candice, if you want to try to hop in, and she, uh, she promised to argue with us. So go ahead, Candice. We can't hear you yet, Candice. But let's move on. We'll, we'll hop in later if you can. Um, Kristen, De, Kristen DeServo asks a great question, um, which is, does the digital data collected in online learning environments reduce the need for tests as we know them? What if we gather and aggregate that data? Um, this might not exactly be what Kristen's talking about, but some of that reminds me of some of the things that we discussed about stealth assessment. This idea that one of the things that feels uncomfortable about assessment to teachers is it's like, we'll do regular learning and do regular learning. And now we're gonna stop and do this thing called assessment. Um, and wouldn't it be better if instead of doing this regular thing called assessment, we just let people keep doing the thing that they were doing and sort of gather data in an online environment. So there's a woman at Florida State University. And in the book, I say that she's from the University of Florida and that's wrong. She's from Florida State and it's at the top of my errata. So if Val <laughs> Shoot ever listens to this, you have my apology. Um, this was, this was fact-checked by multiple people and we got this one wrong, but it's my fault. Um, but to Val Shoot at Florida State University, you know, she's built a system like called Newton's Playground. Um, and basically you do a bunch of physics puzzles and the idea is by watching people do a buzz, bunch of physics puzzles, you ought to be able to infer their understanding of physics without having to stop them and being like, okay, calculate this formula like give me this definition. Um, that's at least how I interpret Kristen's question. Where, where do you see that as sort of a, a frontier for this? So we have people at WCER where I work now um, that are, tr are building these educational games like Val's work. She used to be at ETS, by the way. We overlapped a teeny bit. She's just fantastic and such a brilliant thinker. Um, I hope she gets the clarification. I'm I imagine she's probably read your book, but at any rate, um, one of the things that is the puzzle that the field faces right now that frankly at ETS we were still really working on and had not made a tremendous amount of progress is how you score that thing. Here's the deal with all that metadata. The metadata is useless without a very clear design about the ways somebody can go through that um, assessment that I'll, I'm going to call it a task because when you frame a task, let's take one that might be familiar to all of us. Like say you put someone in a, we have a problem solving one at ETS that some researchers are working on and you want three people in a virtual environment, let's say, to solve some problem. So you, you have to make decisions as a designer about what do you include, what are the prompts, what are the likely ways someone would access the various resources? Are you trying to measure just their ability to learn as they go, let's say, 
the tools of problem solving? Or are you, for example, also trying to understand um, to what degree over, let's say, two hours of interactions with games in this vein, do they begin to learn how to close their mouth and ask a question that somebody else can answer, which is the collaborative you know, problem solving skill. So the knowledge versus the skills that you're trying to assess require you on the front end when you build that, those tasks to have a very clear idea about what the claim is on the back end that you wanna be able to make about the person going through it. And that is a serious engineering problem that also requires you to specify a way to score. You, you have to say to yourself, what are we gonna pump out of this thing? A number, one to four, Courtney's better than she was the time before she did it. She gets a four, if she did better this, quote unquote better. A three, do we weigh her knowledge of problem solving skills? The same as we weigh the, uh, her skill at being able to close her mouth and listen to other people and elicit other people thinking in the problem solving space. Like those are all like the nitty gritty, uh, down in the weeds design decisions that have, so you gotta have thought it, you have to have thought about if you hope for us to be able to make any kind of a claim on the back end. So I hold real possibility for that, but we should not kid ourselves that those are really complicated design spaces to develop. And if we could figure out how to do it over multiple ones, I think we really could build um, both curriculum and sort of assessments that could do the kind of thing that Val is after and others as well are after. Um, Chris, but one of the, the, says you, the, the statements you made is that there's got to be some way of choosing in advance how you're going to score it. Like, why does the assessment need a score is Chris Buttermer's question. Yeah, it's such a good question. I don't, I don't think it does need a score depending on your purpose, right? So if, and this, this gets to the scale issue, Justin, that you talk about. Um, so what do we want the technology to do for us? What do we want the assessment to do for us? Let's say you're a teacher and what you really care about is the degree to which students are learning to elicit one another's thinking and respond to it appropriately. So maybe in that, and you use it more formatively for, and diagnostically for you as the teacher. So you wanna watch as a group of 25 kids are working on these tasks and you need some way to report out. The, the computer program needs some way to report out and you then as the teacher need some way to figure out, is it, is it changing in the direction I want it to change? So maybe those are verbal descriptions, maybe they're summary, who knows? Doesn't have to be a number, but as soon as you start to get up to scale and you want any of those data to inform larger scale decisions, like at the school level or maybe even at the classroom level, do they all understand it or not, those kinds of things. In general, we tend to get down to numbers. Um, we need a way to summarize movement on some okay. underlying principle. Yeah, even if we, you know, I mean, I think very common the assessment, we use it to sort and rank people to say you, you belong here and you don't belong here. But even if you got rid of the sorting and ranking function, I mean, one of the things that you all do in your center of Wisconsin is do these English language learner tests. And part of what you, you could, you could choose never to use those English language learner tests to sort and rank. You could just use them to say, um, what parts of English language learning do students in X school typically get better at quickly? And what part do they get better at slowly? Because if we could find the things that they're getting better at slowly, that might be a better place to invest our professional development or other kinds of resources. You, would, you wouldn't need to, you know, you wouldn't necessarily have to have sorting and ranking as one of your goals in order to have scores be something um, that you think you would find useful, you know, especially if you then were the state of Wisconsin and saying, okay, across all of our schools, um, what are our English learning teachers doing well? Where did they need more help? Um, you, you know, those are the kinds of uh, sort of education policy decisions that we want to make um, that, that might want to um, have some numbers associated with them. Um, Good, that's enormously helpful, sort of why things are slowly developing. Um, it would be great to hear more both from Audrey and Courtney about sort of other things in the chapter that you thought, oh, this doesn't sound quite right or we ought to rethink uh, um, that. Um, and then if there are questions that are, um, that are coming up in the chat, it would be great to hear for, from some other folks. Um, so no, um, I'll process the chat, but Audrey and Courtney, were there, were there things in the chapter that you, that you found otherwise where you went, oh, I'm not sure if that's the right way to think about this? Um, I, let me think. I don't think that there was for me. I was really, I was really struck with the, um, the couple of pieces. And actually, I think it, it 
to ties into what Kristen the Serbo said about, you know, since we're doing with does dig digital data contain all the answers for us? Um, this this idea of what you're talking about with the reification fallacy, right? That like when we call it a math test, we we're like assuming that that's that the math the math is the part that we're um, that the test is somehow only capturing when really it captures a lot and fails to capture um, a lot of a lot of other things. And coming back to Kristen's point, just thinking about the ways in which I do think that there is a narrative, and I think a lot about um, uh, what's his name? He's at Google. Um, Peter Norvig. He wrote a piece on I think it was called the unreasonable effectiveness of data. Just this idea, and I think it is very commonly held within a lot of um, a lot of engineering folks. That as long as we do have tons of data, the answers are going to the answers are going to bubble up to the top. Um, Norvig would say, you know, we don't need theory anymore, right? We just have we have data, and I think that that runs really counter to some of the stuff that Courtney was talking about, with really carefully thinking about not just how do we design assessment, but how are we just, you know, what are we designing in terms of instruction, in terms of curriculum uh, as well. I love that thought, Audrey. I, I also think one of the things I'd argue back, I guess, just into the chapter is not so much that the chapter gets it wrong, but the chapter narrowly has to talk about assessment kind of as a tool that we can use for a particular purpose. And it uh, puts into the background, right, all authors have to do this, it puts into the background the social setting in which it comes and sits. So the story that you tell about the dual, um, can you create an automated scoring engine that can throw all the words into a word bag and figure out with some amount of sort of similar to human level of reliability, what score that essay should be given. And then the computer programmers on the other side are like, ooh, let's break this thing and let's like figure out how to send a gibberish and have that thing score high. And one of the things that's so profound about that, and, and you do mention it, um, is this idea of uh, like, like some people object to automated scoring engines of text because they feel like um, we write for audiences, we're human beings in interaction. You never write for a, you know, a non-descript audience. You're always writing for a purpose. So already you're bankrupting it by first making an assessment. And second, then when you put an automated scoring engine into the whole thing, it's like, what are, what are we even after anyway? And the thing that it made me think about is the idea that assessment at some level is, is built on this idea that we know what we're measuring and we agree what the thing, the, I'll say scores, what the scores coming out of that assessment mean. And so if the technology is only ever aiming at getting those scores right and doesn't actually aim at getting the meaning right, I, I'll say something provocative. I think we've done something where we've actually started to erode the trust in the assessment itself, because the person taking the test and the person designing the test is actually trying to get at math knowledge. They're actually trying to get at writing capability, right? So that isn't to say we shouldn't work on automated scoring engines, for sure we should, but, but it is to say assessments wind up in social situations and the whole assessment enterprise is built on shared trust and shared meaning in what those scores mean. So to the degree technology begins to undermine that, we've got a serious problem on our hands. Well, I think the most powerful illustration of that undermining of trust and communication, I'm sure there are others, Audrey may have her own suggestions, but was with peer grading. Um, so when massive open online courses were released, um, there are a bunch of folks who realized we're not going to be able to assess some of the things that we most care about um, using multiple choice questions, using AI grading. Um, but it's entirely possible um, that if we ask a bunch of people in the class to evaluate someone else's performance, then what we'll find is that the average of those peer assessment scores comes out to be typically what an expert would say, or that, you know, or that a group of peers will disagree about as much as two experts will. Um, and that proved generally to be true. It proved particularly to be true when people came up with clever mechanisms 
testing people as peers. Um, so they'd say, you know, Courtney, evaluate these five essays from your colleagues and, and then secretly give you two that they had already graded. And so if you were way too easy or way too hard, we could be like, all right, let's downweight Courtney because she's way too tough or she's way too easy. And then if you're right on with those other two, we could upweight you. Once we, once we do a few tricks like that, it turns out that if you randomly assign 100 essays to be graded by peers and then randomly assign 100 essays to be graded by experts that they average out to be about the same scores or reasonably close. Um, but what a grade means to a person in a course is that there is a single mechanism which has evaluated your performance, usually an expert, and then given you some meaningful feedback to it not this gibberish that it just took me three minutes to describe of like, yeah, a bunch of people looked at your thing and we <laughs> averaged it. And we're pretty sure that that average is about what an expert would have given you. Um, and so even though these people are individually clueless, we're fairly confident that the wisdom of the crowds um, should substitute evaluation. Um, and you know some of the research that came back on people's response to this was like, no, this this just doesn't feel right. You know, like it wasn't enough to build the peer assessment technology. You had to sort of re-inculcate people into a new culture where there's a new kind of trust. And there's some, you know, the 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 thing that the peer graders were trying to get away from was these sort of mechanisms of automated assessment that felt cheesy, you know, I mean, it feels gross to have a computer say, you know, well, we didn't actually read your essay. Um, but like we predict based on the, you know, your word usage that a human would have graded it as X. Um, but, but even when you have multiple humans, you still come up with these kinds of, you know, dilemmas in the social situation. Um, I mean, to, to that, to that end, Justin, I mean, I think that this ties back to what we were talking about when Dan, uh, Dan Meyer was the guest, is in that situation, those peers were not part of your community. I mean, we use <laughs> yep, yep. the word peer, um, but in a MOOC with, you know, 10,000 participants, they, they weren't, they weren't really, it wasn't really part of your community. And I think that the other piece that you just sort of alluded to is, you know, a lot of this automatic grading stuff that always makes me chuckle is that, you know, they, they say that, well, we, they, they claim that we're, that the auto graders are just as good as the, as the people who grade, um, you know, grade the essay portions of standardized tests. But um, the essay portions of standardized tests are also graded in these massive warehouses with people making barely minimum wage who are given a very um, uh, are given a sort of a, a rubric to follow it's 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 not the way in which your teacher again who's part of your learning community would grade you um, it's it's a it's a it's a job that someone got up you know from a Craig's from from Craigslist and is making minimum wage doing. I mean, the bar is really low. We're not asking, we're not having students work read by their community. We're not having their writing read by people that they're, um, that they're engaged with. That's right. And, and, you know, I mean, I think it's exactly what Courtney said too about the idea of the sort of you're trying to modify the social situation. Like, hey, the 10,000 of you that are taking this class, you're a community now and your community is going to evaluate that. And of course, lots of people go, no, 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 I'm pretty sure these 10,000 people I've never seen before, you know, some of which are just typing gibberish into this peer editing thing are not my community. Um, yeah, that, absolutely right. That, that peer editing might come off very differently in a group of 30 or 40 that know one another, um, rather than in a group of 10,000, you know, for whom you could never plausibly meet. Um, uh, uh, Eric, who works on graspable math, makes a comment um, where he's saying that part of what they're trying to do with their particular piece of education technology related to stealth assessment is to not make people feel like they're being assessed. Um, because when people feel like they're being assessed, then they behave in different ways that are not real world ways. Um, you know, in, every, in, in your field, Courtney, of, of teacher evaluation, this must come up all the time. I teach a certain way when it's just me and my students in the classroom. As soon as someone else walks in, you know, with a Palm Pilot that's taking notes on my performance um, or, or with a rubric or with a video camera or something like that, I go, oh, maybe I don't want to teach as regular, you know, regular me like makes a bunch of off color jokes and regular me like, you know, does these other kinds of things. Um, I mean, is that connected to this idea that, you know, that, that 
of the observer effect again. As soon as we, if, if as soon as we tell you you're being assessed, you start doing something different, you know, it seems like a major problem with assessment. By definition. And then when you scale it, you get Campbell's law, right? Which is like sort of disastrously <laughs> double disaster. So you've impacted it by assessing it. And now you incentivize certain kinds of behaviors, which is like back to the thing Audrey was commenting on, like we reify this is what we think math learning is down to this assessment, right? So it, but here's the thing, it's not like out there in nature, so to speak, out in the wild, everything is all great. Things are not great, right? Lots of kids, lots of kids are not learning what we want for them to learn, what they're capable of learning. So we shouldn't somehow, you know, vilify assessment as like, oh, this thing is just awful on a hundred. It's not, but we absolutely have to have clear eyes that even in a technology enhanced environment, it's only ever going to do part of the work that we need it to do. And if we could, in my mind, if we could get over that and be like, yeah, okay, it's only going to do part of it. Let's figure out how to make it do the work that it's best suited to do from a technology standpoint. Like we were talking about at the beginning, Justin, build rich environments, figure out how to get to interactions. That, that feels like that's really good and that's a fruitful direction to press ourselves in as researchers. And what, and what sort of sustains you? Because this is something that you've dedicated so many years of your career towards, you know, but you, you come at this as a bit of a skeptic. Um, you know, you come at this with some authentic teaching experience and then you decide to go into assessment design and because you're there you know you see all of the problems and all of the challenges that audrey described um what are the things that make you go sort of at the end of the day but yeah this is still a thing worth really pushing on and worth really trying to get better at i mean i guess this is so personal left to our own devices, like we're tribalists, right? We're people who we love one another, we wanna take care of one another, but the truth is we're pretty bad at doing it with people that are different than ourselves. And we have a really long history in this country and around the world of doing that to one another. So assessment can be, and people will really hate this thought, one thought, one upside of NCLV, no child, the left, no child left behind, which was this act which sort of mandated greater assessment um, in third through eighth grade and 10th grade in the United States. Um, it shed light on something that had been going on in the United States for years, which is we had been failing certain groups of kids systematically for and, and egregiously, egregiously. Now, it led to a ton of horrific other implications, bubble kids and all kinds of teaching behaviors and test prep kind of things that, that truly have been very detrimental for education. But if we can't know what the pro if we can't document that there's a problem, it's very hard to act on it. So for me, if we take assessment and we right size our expectations of it, and we try to work on its most productive aspects, and we treat it as a part of a larger system that we use to help ourselves get better in this democracy, speaking specifically in the US context, to create more equitable learning opportunities and outcomes for all children in this country, I think that's the best we could hope for. And I, I'm not optimistic we'll do it without something that sheds that light. I guess that's the thing. So in some ways it's like the worst of two evils. Do we like let ourselves be just regular, keep going as we are, or do we you pick a tool or set of tools, put it together with other information and and chain ourselves to that as a society to try to use it as a tool to improve overall. And I guess I choose the second. Well, I don't think you could have a more impassioned argument for sort of the tinkerer's uh, view towards assessment that, uh, um, that this, this is what we have, um, you know, there's a particular function that it can perform if we build that well and if we build the whole system around that well. Um, and to, you know, for, for all of its imperfections to say, well, let's keep kind of working on this thing until we can get it more right. Um, Audrey, do you have any parting words thinking about uh, the trap of routine assessment for this week? Yeah, I mean, it's been interesting to watch the chat and, and think about this idea, um, the ideas of, you know, how how do students feel anxiety and distrust around assessment and how how do we create situations where um, students students feel less anxiety and i think that you know i think that part of that is is not actually having the stealth assessment so that students are actually sort of 
not not just tested on you know not just having their tests you know tests once every other year or a big test in the spring but the students are somehow always being always being assessed um, seems to be um, lead us down to some other paths that we've talked about already with surveillance and I guess we'll talk about with, with canvas right when we think about think about data um, but you know so I, I do think you know how do we how do we how do we how do we answer some of these questions and are there ways in which we can think about it without being so reliant on scores you know i think that that's a important takeaway terrific well audrey waters thank you once again um courtney bell thank you so much for joining us a really great conversation and one that i hope a lot of folks uh, will have benefited from. I know it was helpful for me to think about um, some of the ways that the that the chapter, the track assessment, proposes some ways forward. Um, but you've you've added some more to that list, um, which was really wonderful. So thank you so much, Courtney, for joining us. Yeah, thank you guys. It's great. Good. Um, we've got one more conversation coming up next week with Candace Dill, um, who helped develop the Open Learning Initiative and then uh, went and worked at Stanford, is now uh, one of the, I don't know her exact title, Chief Learning Officer at Amazon.com, wonderful uh, thinker and researcher. And we're gonna be talking about data and data collection. We're gonna be talking about experimentation, and we're gonna talk about you know, the powerful ways that these tools might be able to improve online learning and learning at scale, and then also the ways that they can feel pretty gross um, collecting vast amounts of data about small children and using them as guinea pigs in experiments. Um, and like this week, we'll try to find, uh, see if there are any pathways forward through those thorny dilemmas. So thanks to everyone for joining. Um, stay safe out there around the world and we hope we'll see you uh, next week with Candace and Audrey again. Um, and then one last week to wrap up the book um, with uh, uh, Kevin Gannon and Kathy Davidson. Thanks so much everybody, have a great afternoon.